entire psalm right now, but what I do want to do is read just a couple of verses, starting with verse 10. The days of our years are three scores and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet their strength in labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply to our hearts in wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our most gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we come here this morning before you with questions in our heart, with thankfulness in our heart, questions that uh, we need answered by you. We come here to study your word. We pray that you send your Holy Spirit to guide us, to indwell us, and to Help us to understand your word and what your will is for our lives. Thank you for all that you do for us, for supplying our daily needs. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Most of the things that we buy, you'll notice, have an expiration date. Anyone who's tasted a glass of milk after that expiration date knows how important those dates can be. Our, our medicines have a date after which they are no longer effective. There's a date when our warranty on our cars or our, our TV sets uh, runs out. We don't usually remember what those dates are. But it's usually the day before it breaks down. Solomon reminds us that everything under heaven has an expiration date. In Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 2, we read, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. So everything has a season. Sometimes it's obvious to us to, us to figure out we, we plant our crops in, this, in the spring, and we, we harvest them in the fall. But Solomon here tells us that it's not just agriculture that has seasons. Everything under the sun has a season. And also, everything under the sun has a purpose. So there's a time for each of us to be born. In, in my case, it happened to be August the 20th, 1952. Now, I don't exactly remember that particular day, what went on. My mother reminds me about it all the time. I, I'm told my, my parents were supposed to go to uh, see Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis on the Steel Pier in Atlantic City, and I decided to come along and change their plans at the last minute. Deep down inside, we all know that our time here on Earth is limited. We're born, we stick around for a little while, and then eventually our time comes to an end. In the case of our scripture here in verse 10, we read, Moses says that he is 70 years old and prays that maybe by the will of God he may live to the age of 80, but he also says that he knows that eventually his life will be cut off. We have no clue when that will happen, whether it be the day that Christ returns or the day that our bodies fail us and we ourselves are called home. In either case, our mortal life has an expiration. Just yesterday, our, our family had a, a, a memorial service for a, a, a family member, uh, my nephew, who, who died a year ago. Young man, middle 30s, very healthy, very strong, 
had no clue what was about to happen. He went to sleep one night and never woke up. No explanation. It could happen at any moment. None of us here can guarantee that we will still be alive to lay our heads on our pillows tonight. In our study last week, Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, was describing it as a reclothing of this mortal body with what is true life. Death is not an end, it's a continuation at least for those of us who are born-again Christians. In his first letter to the Corinthians, in verse 1553, Paul tells us, For this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. We'll get back to 1 Corinthians 15 in a little bit, but the point is, Paul says this must happen. God's eternity is perfect. So perfect that nothing even remotely corruptible can exist there. Not even this earth. This earth, which was corrupted by Satan, cannot continue on into eternity. We read in 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall be melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and all the works that are in it, will be burned up. And then in Revelation 21.1 we read, where John tells us, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So eventually, every one of us will make that transition. At least every one of us who are born again of the Holy Spirit. The unsaved will also eventually drop this earthly body, but rather than transition to life and immortality, their transition will be to death and eternal suffering. The early church was expecting that Christ would return at any moment, just as we are today. But in the early church, they did not have understanding. They did not have a lot of the scripture that we have to understand about Christ's second coming. The Corinthians and and the Thessalonian Christians in particular were confused and concerned because they saw fellow Christians dying, and they, in their minds, they thought, that they would not be able to partake in the glory when Christ returns. Paul found it necessary to write the early churches and explain, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15. We look at verses 15 to 54. Paul says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. The corruptible cannot inherit incorruption. When Christ returns... The dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible. And at that time, we who are still here and alive will replace our corruptible bodies with the incorruptible. And all that is mortal will put on immortality. And so we realize that the death of a Christian is not necessarily a a bad thing. This is not to say that we shouldn't grieve. Even Christ himself as he walked to the tomb of his dead cousin Lazarus grieved he cried but we also have to realize that grieving is only a human quality in Psalm 116:15 we read something very odd to us at first it says precious In the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Sounds like an odd statement, but try and imagine it from God's point of view, as God sees it. From God's point of view, the death of one of his children is a joyous celebration. After all, a child of his has escaped 
this sinful, evil world. He's crossed the finish line. A child of his who he loves deeply will no longer need to suffer trials or tribulations or persecution in this evil world. That child would no longer have to face suffering, no more sorrow, no more sickness, and most important, no more separation from him. The moment we leave this earthly body, we are instantly present with the Lord, never again to be separated. Eternal life, incorruptible, and forever present with the Lord. Something tells me you need a little story. There were three men standing around having a, a normal conversation, and somehow that conversation kind of worked its way around to death. Someone made a suggestion. They said, let's you know, try and imagine your funeral. You're laying there in the coffin, and one by one, the mourners walk up to pay their last respects. What would you like to most hear from those mourners? Well, the first man turned and he said, uh, you know what I'd like to hear? I'd like to hear he was a wonderful father. He always put his family needs above his own. He loved them. He gave them guidance. And because of that, his children grew up to be fine people that everyone looked up to and admired. The second man said, you know what I'd like to hear? I'd like to hear, he was a great humanitarian. Everything he did was unselfish to help others. He helped the poor. He fed the hungry. He stood up for what he believed in. He really made an impact and will never be forgotten. Well, these first two men turned and they looked at the third man and they asked him, you know, what is it that you would most like to hear? And the third man replied, Look, he's moving. <laughs> we don't want to face death. We want life to continue on forever. But as we read from Paul, it can't happen. This corruptible body must put on incorruption or we can't exist in God's eternity. None of us want to think about death. We all push it off. Once in a while, it crosses our mind a, a, a second thought, usually uh, at a bad point where we, where we suffer a terrible accident or, or later on in life as we grow older. I kind of had that realization last year on my birthday, and I realized, gee, almost two-thirds of my life is already behind me. In our scripture today, in Psalm 90, verses 12 through 14, Moses asked the Lord to teach him to number his days. He says, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. David makes nearly the same request of the Lord in, in Psalm 39, verses 4 and 5. David says, Jehovah, make me, know, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is. Let me know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely every man at his best estate, is altogether vanity. In both cases, both Moses and David, they were not actually asking God, how long do I have to live? How many days do I have remaining? But they were looking for help to always keep in mind that their time is limited. So it's not really so important as to counting the days, but making the days count. James reminds us in James 4, 13 and 14, Come now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city. We'll spend a year there and trade and get gain. 
whereas ye know not what shall be on tomorrow. For what is your life? It is a mere vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We all need to count the days in terms of making those days count. Time for another story. This one, not necessarily funny, but enlightening. Three demons were debating over how to put an end to the Christian church. The first said, well, let's tell all the people that there is no heaven. We'll take away the reward and the church will crumble. The second said, Let's tell all the people there is no hell. Take away the fear of punishment and the church will crumble. And then the third said, let's tell the people there is no hurry. Time will run out and the church will crumble. How true is this today? How many people today are denying the fact that heaven or hell even exist? How many people today are saying, what, go to church Give my life over to Christ. I've got plenty of time to do that. You don't know. You may not wake up tomorrow. And so it's all about time. You can see it in your outline. T-I-M-E. T is for trust. Specifically trust in the Lord. Look at Psalm 90, 10. The days of our years are threescore and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. As each of our days pass, even with all of our labors and sorrows, we may see we need to trust in the Lord and to focus on the fact that at the end of days, each of us as Christians will have one way or another fly away to be with Christ, whether it be through our own death or whether it be when Christ returns. Paul teaches us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive will be caught up together that, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort each other with these words. Comfort one another with this truth as we mourn the passing of a loved one. Death is not an end, but a continuation. In Psalm 9, 10, we read, and they that know thy name will put thy trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Put your trust in the Lord and remember that he has not forsaken you. Christ himself, he, he cried from the cross in Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why has you forsaken me? Because he took on the sins of all mankind. But we, as born-again Christians, saved by grace, never have to experience that. God promises us he will never forsake us. He will not forget you. In Psalm 46, 1 to 3, we read, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we have no worries. God is with us. The I is for inquire. Psalm 90, 16, Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. Let God's work be known to us. Each day that we have remaining, we need to inquire of God, what is your will for me today? What is it that God would have you be doing today? In Psalm 32, 8, we read, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. When we inquire of the Lord, 
what he wants for us, he will instruct us in the ways we are to go. In a hymn by Helen Lemel, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, we sing, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. M is for magnify. In Psalm 91 and 2, we read, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Here, Moses is opening his prayer, magnifying the name of the Lord, praising God for his greatness. And we should take that as an example. Christ, when he taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, started out by praising God, by magnifying his name. David says in Psalm 69, 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Too many people today approach God in prayer with too much familiarity. How many of us would even think to approach royalty like the Queen of England, greet her with a slap on the back saying, hey, Queenie, how's things going? How much more magnificent and how much more powerful and how much more reverent is God? We need to treat him with the reverence that he deserves. E is for enrich. Psalm 90, 17, and let the beauty of the Lord God be upon us. And establish thou the work of your hands upon us. Yea, the work of your hands, establish thou it. We need to enrich our lives by simply allowing the beauty of the Lord to shine through us. Is there anything more beautiful than the glory of God? The beauty of the Lord should shine in our lives so that anyone who sees us or knows us will immediately recognize that we are different We are not like all the others. Psalm 23, 6, David says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We can make a difference in the direction of our lives, the direction that we take from this point forward. Joseph Wittig A German theologian and author, he he died in 1949, but he once made a remark. And he stated that when when we write people's biographies, we need to start with their death, not with their birth. After all, Whitting said, we have nothing to do with the way our life began, but we have everything to do with the way that it ends. Take a bit of advice from Paul, who says in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. We must take take stock. In the, in the days that are remaining in our lives. We must learn not so much to count the days, but to make those days count. Trust in the Lord. Inquire of his will. Magnify his holy name. And enrich ourselves as a reflection of his glory. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have together to study your word, to learn what it is that your will that needs to be in our lives. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who guides us, who teaches us. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly went to the cross, gave up his own life to pay the penalty that we deserved for our own sins so that we may have life eternal. 
We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to hymn number 111.